welcome to this panel on nationalism, media, and uh, propaganda. And as I said, trust editors to pick absolutely the worst news day in five years <laughs> for uh, for a session like this and for a cocktail like this. But be that as it may, we all have to soldier on. Um, and I'm, uh, you know, uh, sure that the discussion we have today um, will, will um, you know, in a sense, reflect closely on events that have unfolded over the past five years and which are going to unfold uh, as we go ahead. There's an, any number of directions in which a panel with this title can go, nationalism, propaganda, and media. Uh, what I thought is that I'll take advantage of the, uh, the fact that we have three um, uh, experienced reporters and journalists who have kind of over their career straddled and dealt with issues of, of nationalism and propaganda in various ways. Uh, and I thought that I would maybe draw them out on different aspects of uh, the way in which nationalism and propaganda operate. Uh, and um, you know, the, each of them will, I've, I've kind of picked a set of questions for each of them just to get them going. Um, I will phrase these questions before I invite you to speak. And uh, I hope you confine your remarks to seven to eight minutes each so that we have then about 20, 25 minutes for, uh, for discussion from the floor. Um, I'm not going to uh, bother introducing any of the speakers because they've already been done. But uh, let me kick things off with, uh, with Sohasini. Uh, Sohasini, is the media today capable of being professional and, ob and objective when it comes to the broad set of subjects that come under the, under the term nationalism? And in your experience and based on what you've seen uh, in your years earlier in television, now with The Hindu, uh, what are some of the challenges that journalists face when it comes to covering issues of foreign policy and national security? Um, thanks a lot, uh, Siddharth, and thank you to the Editors Guild for inviting us for something, uh, you know, which is a kind of daily battle that foreign policy journalists, um, I, I'm on the foreign policy beat, uh, play out every day. Some of those battles are played out on Twitter and you no doubt see, uh, uh, you know, how they are. Um, and it all boils down to one idea. Uh, and I'm being simplistic here, but it boils down to the idea of the question that we are asked again and again on Twitter. Are you an Indian or are you a journalist? Somehow your role or your, uh, your label as an Indian or your identity as an Indian is expected to completely, uh, you know, sort of subsume all other identities, including what you do. I often answer them by saying, uh, I am an Indian being a journalist is what I do. And there is therefore a distinction. But it has become much more difficult uh, over the years for a number of reasons. And I'm not saying India is a, um, is, is a sort of outlier. There are many qu countries where some of the things I'm going to speak about, um, you see. Uh, I mean, there was this idea in the old days of the difference between nationalism and patriotism and nationalism meaning uh, that uh, uh, um, uh, that you loved your country, sorry, patriotism meaning that you're proud of your country for what it does. And uh, nationalism means you're proud of your country no matter what it does. Um, in, in other words, you're not expected to question. Um, there are three ways where I would say when you cover foreign policy and national security issues, uh, where things are not only changing, they are becoming more and more difficult. The first most obvious one is in how we cover those countries that are seen as adversaries to India and to the government in particular. So in the old days, those would mean China and Pakistan. Today, they mean China, Pakistan, Canada, Maldives, anyone the government is having a, a spat with within the week. And what we actually see is a lot of, because a lot of this is also, you know, self decided. It's not as if there's some dictate coming on every issue uh, from, from some official. Uh, at the end of it, you what you do here is other journalists who have become more adversarial than the government itself. So in the most recent case with the Maldives, for example, you had a situation where you know journalists had already built scenarios of war, of uh, taking it out on the Maldives, of showing them their place, economic uh, um, boycotts as well as other security boycotts. Whereas in actuality, what the government has agreed to do is to hold talks, uh, to continue to hold those talks, 
and eventually to accept the Maldives demand that Indian troops would be uh, would be pulled out of the Maldives and and that if the uh, Maldives doesn't want troops in uniform that you send technical civilian uh, personnel in their place. So I give that just as an example to say this is the mahal, this is the atmosphere we're in when we're dealing with them. When it comes to countries like China, when it comes to countries like Pakistan, let's remember we are not in a state of war. There is no declared war with them at present where other laws would come into place. <clears throat> at present we are just in a situation of major tensions with them. Uh, according to the Prime Minister and a, uh, and a comment he made way back in 2020 which he has never updated. So I presume that this remains the, uh, the government's official position. Nobody has entered Indian territory and no Indian post is with anybody else. That's what he said in June 2020 on national television. That hasn't changed yet. And yet, on a daily basis, journalists are harangued, journalists are held up for stories that are seen as in some way um, uh, playing, you know, playing to the other side. Um, we see that, of course, with Pakistan, which also brings in a certain communal uh, flavor uh, to, to that kind of thing. So that's one, where those that have an adversarial relationship with India, we are expected to be even more adversarial than the government is. And if you aren't, then you are clearly uh, in some way, um, uh, you know, biased, motivated or worse, working for the other side. The second is the, the loss in the ability to do critical analysis of agreements, even with those areas where India has good relations. So if we have a deal with the US, uh, it becomes that much more difficult to find ways to analyze it. In 2015, January, the Prime Minister and the US President Obama stood together and, and these are technical issues, I'm not trying to simplify them for you, but they stood together and said, you know, the nuclear deal is done. Um, it is now 2024 and clearly that nuclear deal was never done or the understanding which was going to allow American uh, manufacturers to begin nuclear power plants in India, that deal was never done. Now critical analysis at that time was completely shut down, was denied by the government. A uh, critical analysis over a period of time is made irrelevant. So that intelligent conversation that we seek to have with our reader or our viewer actually goes away. If it's a deal with France, uh, you are not allowed to critically analyze, did we pay too much? Uh, if it is, uh, if it is uh, um, uh, any other kind of investment that India is making or it is um, uh, the decision to increase uh, oil from Russia, again, the idea is, Fine. If it is a policy statement that India is increasing its oil intake from Russia, if it is going to route it through a uh, half Russian owned refinery uh, and then actually is going to what is now being called uh, uh, oil laundering, uh, then produce it as refined products and sell it back to the West. Somehow even that kind of critical analysis is now lacking and those who do it do tend to be able to tell you what kind of uh, reactions they get. And the third part I think where we feel it on a daily basis is the gradations of ways in which people who cover national security and cover foreign policy in particular are targeted. So at the top level and, and uh, you know, I mean, we consider ourselves lucky until uh, we have to deal with those challenges. There are those who face real national security laws, whether it's journalists in Kashmir or whether it is uh, um, uh, journalists, uh, you know, in, in, in organizations here who have been raided, who have been arrested. The bar of evidence is so low that you can't actually you can't even ask what the evidence is. Just the severity of the cases, and this is not frankly happening just now, it's been happening for a couple of decades, where you have allowed uh, normal laws to become applicable, normal security laws to become applicable to journalism as well. In the old days, there was a different standard with that. Uh, then the next level is the insinuation, uh, the stories that government denies even though they're true. Uh, um, and uh, certainly puts out the insinuation that they are motivated, biased. And of course, uh, that is picked up not just, for example, in Twitter, because it's possible to just go off Twitter or X or whatever it's called, um, but in websites that are government funded, which have specific beats of specific journalists and put out stories uh, about what they do. Um, and I think the third is the, the general restriction of access. Whatever is happening between Indian and Chinese forces at the LAC 
This must be the first such conflict where there is no journalist who has been able to go further than Lay. I think except for one or two examples where journalists were flown for maybe a few hours to the LAC, shown something and they're brought back. There is no coverage of the conflict. How is it going? There is just an acceptance of how it's going, which is great. How is the Josh high? Um, and as a result, we have allowed ourselves to, to walk into smaller and smaller cages where the, you know, where the ability to cover issues which have always been complex, which have always required a certain expertise, those are the issues which have unfortunately been simplified into how are we doing? Great. Thanks a lot, uh, Suhasini. Uh, you've touched on um, the broad brush as well as hinted at specific examples. And I'm sure in the conversation that we have with the audience, uh, we will get into um, individual examples, uh, case studies, and so on, to that will illustrate what she's saying. Uh, my next, our next speaker will be uh, Smita Gupta. Uh, Smita, uh, you've worked as um, kind of political reporter and editor. Um, Going back for the tenure of four or five governments, you you know more starting with the independent or perhaps even earlier uh, with Indira Gandhi. Okay, uh, and uh, since I've known you and we worked together, Times of India, even then in Outlook, then in Hindu, uh, and now as a as a well well regarded commentator, freelancer, uh, how you know your your focus has been politics throughout your career, but. Uh, Politics clearly intersects the arenas of nationalism and propaganda. Uh, and, you know, you've seen firsthand. So in your view, obviously, journalists have always faced challenges in this in this arena. How has this evolved or changed over the different governments and regimes that you've seen? And uh, is there something specific about what we are confronting today? Thank you, Siddharth. Um, as I said, I joined the profession when Indira Gandhi was uh, a prime minister uh, in 79 actually. So the first two prime ministers that I saw were at a distance, Indira Gandhi and Rajiv Gandhi. Uh, and uh, the period that I covered, uh, Rajiv Gandhi was prime minister, I was at the Indian Express where it was a virulently anti-Congress newspaper, you know. Uh, but I, we just saw it at a distance and uh, but I'll just recall one small incident when in the, uh, there was a riot in Bhivandi. I used to be uh, posted in the Indian Express Bombay. And Mrs. Gandhi came there on a visit, uh, accompanied uh, by uh, Rajiv Gandhi, uh, who was Party General Secretary, Congress Party General Secretary. And our common friend, Vidya Subramaniam, had been sent to cover it that day. And Indira Gandhi was Prime Minister, but she got, she was standing next to Indira Gandhi. Indira Gandhi was talking to one of the victims and uh, she was trying hard to hear the conversation uh, when Rajiv Gandhi apparently said, what's he saying? To which Vidya said, if you just shut up and listen, uh, you would hear clearly. To which Rajiv apologized, you know. So we are going back to a time when, uh, you know, we were what? In our early 20s. And we would think nothing of doing something like that. We were so intent on the story. But my actual interactions with Prime Ministers began with VP Singh. Uh, and if VP Singh epitomized open government to a fault, uh, it, I ended with uh, Narendra Modi, who as we all know, represents closed government. Uh, there are dangers to an open government, and uh, which is why that government fell in those 11 months. But for journalists of my generation and those of us who were covering the Janta Party, Janta Dal at that time, the government, I mean, we could get stories from everybody. All I mean, we could go into ministers' rooms, ministers' homes, uh, you know, in the evening without an appointment, and people would talk to us. Uh, this if it was largely peopled by the socialists who are <laughs> destructive as we know. But for somebody starting out, it seemed like that was the norm. Chandrasekhar was a very brief uh, sort of period and that was somewhat similar. Uh, then uh, we came to Narsimha Rao. Now Narsimha Rao, uh, but even uh, there was a structure. 
there was the, I mean, you always had the Press Information Bureau. You had officials there. You had a principal information officer. And as far as I remember, right up to Dr. Manmohan Singh's period, that principal information officer was expected to hold one, one to five briefings a week. Some like um, Ramon Rao, Mr. Ramon Rao, who actually, I think, uh, dealt with three prime ministers. He made it a, a, you know, practice to do it, where people were allowed to ask questions. Obviously, he wasn't going to tell you state secrets, but he would give you enough information to be able to do your story, give some, add something to your story. You could kill, call him up at 12 at midnight, and he would say, let me see. And he'd call you back in 10 minutes. So uh, there was that structure. In the prime minister's office also, there were certain officials. I remember Jairam Ramesh used to be there, for instance. Um, I was still fairly junior, but those who were senior to me had access to many more officials. Um, then we had, um, after that came Vajpayee. Vajpayee also had a, you know, despite the fact that that's also the BJP, the he had Brijesh Mishra who would talk to journalists about policy issues. He had, uh, you know, um, Mr. Ashok Tandon who would who was a general media advisor. He was also extremely open. He would, you know, you could talk to him. You could call him up at any hour of day or night, and get a response. And Ministers, by and large, whether they, they were Arun Jaitley, Sushma Swaraj, all, all these ministers, to greater or lesser extent, you know, we never felt that things had, that we couldn't get any access to information. Everybody obviously will tailor their stories to their own advantage, and it is for you as a journalist to do your homework. But you had a government point of view. Um, then uh, came Deve Gauda, which was somewhat more similar to the VP Singh Chandrasekhar era, where uh, it was even more open. And, uh, you know, I remember in parliament, for instance, Srikant Jena was the parliamentary affairs minister. His room was like uh, the restroom for journalists between, you know, people would go there, take a nap. But you would also you know, understand, because the Parliamentary Affairs Minister is a key person during Parliament <coughs> to understand what is happening, policy issues. Then came uh, the Manmohan Singh government, where again, all these structures were still in place. And in fact, at that time, I remember the Joint Secretaries in the Prime Minister's office, I mean, uh, I don't know whether people know, each of them is given a certain number of subjects to deal with. And you could actually take appointments with any of them. You wanted to talk about economics, you went to Javed Usmani, you wanted to talk about the Home Ministry, you went to Sanjay Mitra, and so on. And, uh, you know, you were able to get that extra, you knew what was happening. Apart from all this, what I forgot to mention is that most, uh, all these Prime Ministers, still Narendra Modi, used to have an annual press conference where, uh, you know, uh, the Prime Minister would open himself up to all kinds of questions. Sometimes there were even some rude questions, I remember, uh, you know. Um, and then, uh, though this overlaps with, I think, something that Suhasini said, at that time, the, you know, when the Prime Minister went abroad, you know, the Prime Minister took a group of journalists, and you would have one or two meetings with him, sometimes on the outward, and and sometimes on the inward trip as well. There would be senior officials, not only from the foreign ministry, but from other ministries. So, you know, you got a sense of what was happening in government. It was up to individual journalists to cultivate people to get that bigger picture. But with the arrival of this government, it's closed shop. Uh, Mr. Modi has not had a single press conference forget the annual Vigyan Bhavan press conference, he doesn't take journalists on his plane. He's not saving any money because the plane is no smaller, you know. And uh, it's uh, newspapers that are picking up the tab for the journalists who are going there. Um, within uh, the P PIB is non-functioning, really. Nobody there is, you know, there are sort of handouts, but you, there, no clarifications can be sought. The principal information officer is just somebody who sits over there. 
within the prime minister's office there is a big communication set up but it it operates in the shadows so there are questions we all have questions but there are no answers coming apart from all this all prime ministers as far as i remember used to have an annual kind of dinner at to which journalists were invited political journalists it could be on the occasion of the you know the day they had taken oath or it could be women's day something or the other so another occasion where you could interact but under modi he does have some for selected journalists i'm told but there is no conversation there you know i think people most journalists who go there spend their time taking selfies with and which you then see on facebook and so on so right now that is a situation where uh nobody is asking even for state secrets but you just want an explanation that why did you sign this treaty with x person or why are you bringing in this bill uh but it's closed it's closed government thanks a lot smita uh, artosh uh smita has focused on uh an important aspect that has uh, of of press functioning which has so completely vanished from our lives that it sounds odd to even <laughs> be reminded that there was such a thing as some measure of openness so thank you for that smita um uh, but you know hartosh the you know as as editor of the caravan you are part of of a small uh but vibrant ecosystem uh and i want to emphasize that this ecosystem um uh, has publications uh in different languages across the country uh small medium large some large uh, lots of freelancers who are battling away uh so so not everything in this country is big media or godi media there's a large vibrant section caravan is very much a part of that and you have been dealing with uh challenges now in your estimation particularly in relation to the question of nationalism uh, that is the theme of our top of, of our panel do you foresee i mean how do you have any sort of advice on how media can deal with the challenges that present themselves today and what is your sense of how these challenges are going to evolve over the next next few months and years is are things going to get worse if so how does one respond could they get better mm. thank you sudarth i as far as the question of advice goes i wish i had some i actually don't it's a bad time in terms of journalism i think our current situation is of a sort of a prey enveloped by a boa constrictor that is slowly and gradually but inexorably tightening its grip and the breath is being sucked sucked out of us in some ways and this is only going to accelerate uh to whatever extent that this ecosystem has to survive or resist or breathe i think we have to understand how we've got here and what are the changes and some of it will overlap with what swasni had mentioned i mean it is not as if when modi came to power in 2014 that we had a very robust healthy media system i also want to just stress that i prefer not to use the terms media and journalism interchangeably the term media is and i try to repeat this is the equivalent of the administration that runs hospitals and journalists are rather like the doctors in the hospitals and we cannot confuse the two the exercise of journalism in the end remains with journalists media is the infrastructure that provides us this the structure of the media itself was hollow by the time modi comes to par he understands that from gujarat um uh, I also just want to compare sort of two stories I was involved in because it reflects directly on the kind of control that was uh, exercised and the first was the radia tapes that we had first done it open <laughs> and uh, there were two things that was evident in the radia tapes it was the close sort of nexus between politics journalism par corporates i think that's true even today as we are seeing on this particular day of what the relationship between electoral politics and corporates and big money is in this country what happened with that story is that the mainstream media actually was aware it for a long time and did not touch it it's not very different from the electoral bonds in the sense that everybody is aware of how bad the situation was and nobody touched it 
But once it did come out, that story, whether from social media or other outfits or other, even national organizations picked that story up, it got amplified, it had a lot of traction. And uh, it did have a political impact on a large scale. Mm. I do remember in one of these uh, studio discussions that was happening, uh, there was a conversation with Veer Sangvi appropriately sitting on a balcony in Thailand. And there were four of us in the discussion. There was Rahul Kamal, that tweedledee, tweedledum to Rajdeep in that uh, channel that they run. There was, uh, Raj, uh, there was uh, Prabhu Chavla, there was MJ Akbar. And they were discussing what is wrong with journalism. And to me, sitting in that room, what was wrong with journalism was the people in that room, basically. And these were people who had been editors for the last 15, 20 years. In some senses, responsibility for journalism goes also lies with editors. And so this is a pretty appropriate forum for discussing what is going on. But there was an impact. It made a difference. People reacted. That public that reacts to journalism has disappeared. The disappearance of the public is one of Modi's great feats in journalism. That what he is, instead of the public, he's created what I would call are the equivalent of football fans. It's that people have worn the Modi jersey, and once you've worn that Modi jersey, it doesn't matter what team Modi does. You are not going to listen to it. You are not going to take negativity on it. And everybody is on the other side is an opponent, is not to be trusted. And journalists lie on the opposing side in some senses. Uh, <laughs> we saw that when we did the Loya story at Caravan, that it was surrounded by the same silence. But this time when the mainstream media picked it up, it picked it up to say, why were these guys doing the story? What were their motives? There were prime time shows run on my predecessor, you know, on me, what we had been tweeting, how we were anti-national. This construction of uh, this football fanism, as opposed to the public, which doesn't react to journalism, is necessary to curtail the power of journalism. If you no longer have a public that reacts to a story, then the story doesn't matter. Uh, we are finding some of that out today. In the face of what we are hearing today, if a government can survive and still go into an election expecting that it will win, then we have reached the point where the truth no longer has any significant impact on how politics is played out. We are in the domain of mass psychology. Journalists do not dwell in the domain of my psychology. We do not address it we deal with facts with rationality with arguments and that's not the domain in which arguments can take place uh, <coughs> lastly despite all this this government is still bothered by what the small ecosystem does and i think this is where you've seen the work constrictor actually tighten its grip it happened to us recently you yourself Siddharth, have been there have been raids at the wire other organizations news click but we actually this time had a story taken down without recourse. We are fighting it in court, but the new laws have reached that absurd level where we report on Kashmir. And Kashmir is a good example of how we have all been reduced in our reportage. First, Kashmiri organizations could no longer report journalism from Kashmir. Then Kashmiri journalists could no longer report our own, and I think Shahid is in this room, so of literally being hounded out from Kashmir by threats <coughs> when a journalist from outside goes and reports on Kashmir and we get detailed stories with testimonies and narratives and facts. Uh, the story is pulled down not because there's a problem with the story. We don't even know who's asked for the story to be taken down. There is no complaint. Nothing is shared by us. and. There is no process that is followed. There is not a single error that the government has pointed out in the story. It has invoked national sovereignty. How is national sovereignty in challenge when the Indian army tortures Indian civilians to death? There is no easy answer to that question. Uh, it is clear there has not even been an application of mind because it says they are acting on complaints regarding what can happen within the state of Jammu and Kashmir, and they take down a tweet that relates to a story on Manipur, basically. So 
clearly these are ad hoc responses but the government now has been empowered to be able to stop news in any possible way i don't think that the answer to this lies with the organizations we can keep doing the work we are doing we can keep pushing back but there has to be a larger ecosystem of pushback that includes the public which doesn't exist which includes political opposition which doesn't exist i think that is also part of our real problem that we should be honest in speaking about the political opposition does not seem very interested in press freedom itself it seems to react to criticism much in the same way as the ruling government does i am not positing a equivalence but they need to listen and understand what is going wrong with them and what is not being done even on a loaded deck and that is not something that they are comfortable with in the absence of that public in the absence of a political opposition in the absence of a sustained intervention by the judiciary we are at the stage where we are going to see an acceleration of what is happening in that maybe what we do as an election show reaching out for support trying to work together trying to strengthen other organizations which function in the same way is perhaps the only choices available to us but we cannot control the larger ecosystem we have to see it in change in some ways before things give Thank you, Arthosh. Uh, so you've heard three um, complementary um, presentations or, or, or sort of narrations about the problem of media and propaganda uh, and nationalism that confronts us. Uh, I just want to add my two cents before I, I, I open the floor. Uh, you know, to my mind, the uh, the cutting edge of uh, the government's sort of offensive. Uh, today is the takedown order and the ability of the government to invoke obscure sections of the law and to prevail upon social media intermediaries to deal with, uh, to ensure that content is made invisible, in, is invisibilized. It should be uh, a simple <coughs> question of logic that if, if a statement or an article is not proscribed by law if it is printed, then it ought not to be proscribed if it's got a digital life. The, you can still go to a newsstand and buy the Caravans magazine. Uh, and, the, and, and that's because there is nothing in it that contravenes any Indian law. It's fully covered by Article 19 of the Indian Constitution, whatever its reasonable restrictions may be. Yet the same article online uh, the government has arrogated to itself the power to get this content removed. Uh, I can share with you information from today. We had published an excerpt from, from the Caravan's uh, article and given a link uh, which exists in the public domain in the internet. You know, various friends of freedom of information have posted the article on PDFs that are beyond the reach of Government of India censors. So we'd given a link and um, we got sent a notice to an address that we don't, you know, that was actually not our proper address. Uh, on March 1st and they held a so-called hearing where we were not present and and then a takedown order was issued. Uh, we are appealing it and challenging it but we've also had no option but to take down the extract that we carried from caravan. Uh, but we are not the only victims. I mean you would have seen in today's papers or maybe you read on, on internet the takedown of um, uh, CBC documentary on uh, Pannu's assassin on, on, on Nijar's assassination, uh, takedown of huge number of farmers uh, Twitter handles. So the farmers are not allowed to march and they're not even allowed to make videos uh, and reach people through, you know, peaceful democratic means. So this, this kind of, uh, you know, invoking of national security uh, one way or the other to clamp down on freedom of expression, which the government does, is not able to do when it comes to the printed word, uh, you know, is something which I think should really concern us and, uh, you know, I'm glad that the EG, EGI exists and the EGI has been very vocal now for the last decade or so uh, in uh, speaking out in defense of, of media freedom and in particular I would say our colleagues in JNK who not only can't report but there is an, uh, there is an unofficial travel ban. Many colleagues have been stopped from, from flying abroad on assignments. They've had their passports confiscated. Uh, so we're dealing with a very, very critical situation here. Uh, and uh, obviously part of this means that there any number of stories that are simply not given their due, they're not covered, or they're covered in a very lackadaisical fashion. Uh, so, you know, the, the Pannu or Niger story, uh, you know, ought to have been much bigger uh, if there was really, you know, the press functioning in a free, in a free fashion. 
Uh, you don't see any debates on television on any of these issues, uh, and that's the state of uh, th that's the state of affairs. And in fact, those who, as so Hasni said, attempt to cover these stories are the ones who then get labelled and branded uh, as anti-national. So uh, I'd like to open the floor now. We have around 10, 10 15 minutes, and uh, I see a hand up over there. Please be brief, sir. And if you have a particular person you're directing a question to, please say Absolutely. so. Absolutely. Uh, very brief. My name is Professor Sanjay Airwal and I teach journalism. My students are here. Thank you, Siddharth, for giving me a chance. And I wanted to congratulate you, uh, Hartosh, for having, and your uh, magazine, for having done that story. We went out, we bought copies of Caravan, and all our students, they read the entire uh, story. And nobody thought that it was anti-national. They thought it was very nationalistic to have done that story. So uh, thank you you and your organizations and all of you who are sitting up there for doing journalism like that so that uh, our students and us also will learn from it. Oh, you are talking about that there is no platform left in television, but at least there are magazines which do. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, there's a mic here, please, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you all for uh, holding up to whatever you guys do. Uh, my question is, uh, I give you an example. There are innumerable examples. Let's take the example of the train, what happened in the train. The RPF. RPF, okay. yes. Uh, we as Indians, uh, this is not directed to media, but as uh, our role or what you guys will do. Now, we are seeing this football team, which uh, you, you were speaking about. Uh, versus couple of you guys who are uh, maybe table tennis team in the other side. We people as masses are getting inured by these experiences, these ugly sins day in and day out. So how do, what is the solution if at all? We cannot reject the football team as such. What is to be done to, to this country? Thanks. I'm going to collect two other questions and then come back to the panel. Uh, lady here in the front. Yahan de dije please. Uh, greetings, uh, panel members. My name is Nandika and I am currently interning for the Indian Express. So my question is recently we saw how, you know, uh, mainstream uh, media, some news organization, they celebrated the idea of the government being involved in something as personal as religion, that is the Ram Temple inauguration. So, and we also saw how, you know, young minds are being brainwashed with this idea of uh, pseudo-nationalism. So what do you think, how do we avoid this situation where it leads, uh, leads to ma mass uh, brainwashing of youth? I'll come to you later, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have been listening that we are very much, you know, the government is formidable to media and media and journalism is very, you know, very difficult. These are the stories we are listening and we are feeling that there is. Now the question arises, why don't the media get into a proper training? You know, this is your job to organize a proper training for a media person and a journalist and to give him ad hoc information of whatever is what is and what is not. Because unless and until a perfect training is given, you can't have a... Got it. Right. Yeah. Thank so you. Training is a must. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll come back. Uh, so, Asti, you want to quickly answer anything from what you've heard? You can pick any of the one questions. Any, any Sh question sure. To, to your question, uh, I honestly feel, and, and this is something I read out of a... Um, uh, a book called How to Be a Dictator, and that does not mean that I'm talking about a dictatorship here. But there's a, there is a, a line in there where it says, everybody knows that an authoritarian wants you to do as he or she says. But very few realize that actually what they want you to do is what he or she, uh, what they want you to do is say what he or she says. That's, that's the difference. Um, I think as journalists, what is important is to hold that line, to not be, you know, uh, pulled into the idea of being us versus them as much as to hold a government to account. 
as the masses, as you, you said, or the readers or the viewers, I think what's really important is to understand that if you want real news, if you want credible news, you're going to have to pay for good journalism. Uh, this is something that we've shied away from in the past. We all do believe that journalism is a public service, but it is not a public service that can be done for free. Uh, and it requires for people to understand that if something is, is asking you to pay, and most people will put up a, a paywall or will ask you, you know, is there some way you can contribute to this journalism? That is becoming more and more important. I think it's as much a, a signal to any government that wants to be authoritarian when people start paying for credible news. After all, people are journalists not because anyone can be a journalist. And you're absolutely right that there is training that goes into it, it's years of experience, um, and there's, a, there's years of public service commitment. Um, and, and the truth is that it's not that everyone can be a journalist. Society wants for journalists to do their job, which is to inform them better, to hold governments to account better, to ask the questions that nobody else is asking, or to put things in perspective that show you that what, what are the various points of view in a, in, in a story. So I think it's very important to, to get that in. My real fear now is um, I see a version of what, what is happening here to the Indian media as a result of what is you know, perceived as a fear of the authoritarianism is bleeding very easily into international media. We used to hold, you know, when you were asking where should we look, we used to hold international media as, as, you know, basically quite fearless when it came to other countries. When you see something like the BBC story, where there's a documentary uh, which seems to be critical of the government in India, which is eventually taken down by the BBC themselves, uh, and the government puts a ban on it. What is really interesting is that that documentary was never meant to be shown in India, that despite everything else, that the company didn't want to. And I won't name the other company, uh, but I was interviewed more recently by an international uh, news agency that ended the interview by telling me, don't worry, this won't show in India. We have to take back this idea that we are entitled to less of a democracy than other people are, that we are entitled to less uh, truth than other people are, that we are somehow allowed to live in a bubble where we don't understand how the world is looking at us. Um, because that's what's going to uh, really, uh, really cost us in the long term. Were you shocked by the yeah, uh, media coverage of the temple? Yeah. See, the media coverage of the temple, and I'm, and I'm just talking about the legacy media. I'm not going into anybody else. I mean, I, the Hindu, the Hindustan Times, Times of India, all three papers, at which I have worked, I was shocked by the headline because it just didn't take into account the fact that a mosque had been destroyed, that there were a whole, you know, a, a section of people in this country who were distraught on that day, that it was not a day of celebration for them. Now, this is not something that you can blame an individual journalist. It's a whole, it's a senior people in the office. And now, why is this happening? I can't imagine in earlier that Maybe somebody might have given a neutral heading, but this kind of celebratory mood, which kind of echoed what the government was saying, uh, it, it was truly shocking. And that also comes into this training. There is training, you get training at, you know, you go to some journalism school and you are taught how to read laws, etc. But the real test comes in the newspaper. What is decided in the newsroom? What are the seniors in the newspapers doing? Or is it that they are under pressure from the owners? I mean, after all, the legacy media is the one that still has the money, still has some money. So, uh, you know, there are questions that need to be asked. In the uh, old days, uh, I don't know, editors knew the prime ministers on first name terms. I don't know whether that helped. I don't know. This is something, Siddharth, you could perhaps weigh in on more. I'm not sure that's always a good thing for yeah. editors. No, 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 not as an editor. Uh, because you understand economics much better than I do, that do you think liberalization had something to do with the way, you know, newspapers, especially the big newspapers, change? Yeah, I'll come to that at the end. But Hartosh, any, you want to make any response to the trading? Is, is lack of trading the issue? I doubt if we are at a place where training is the issue or there's a lack of good journalists. There's a lack of spaces where good journalism can be done because the media itself is compromised. Uh, what we need, in fact, is uh, 
to expand places where journalists can do what they need to do. Today the situation is, and I speak of uh, journalists work in our organization and maybe some other organizations which are doing similar work that they're perhaps the best journalists in the industry. The price of being really good at your job today in a perverse sense is to be paid less than everybody else who's compromised and who subverts every aim of the profession. And this is what we have created in terms of journalism. Uh, also, this shrinking of the number of places where journalism can be done is happening at a time when the country itself, the numbers are increasing from the time to me, the existence of, I have worked as a district correspondent, as a state correspondent, of people actually being based out there reporting back. We don't have that any longer. Uh, we are surprised by what is happening in much of the country because we don't have access to it. We also haven't, and just one last point, that uh, there are two things to the BJP project that makes it very successful as a political machine. One is the politics of hatred directed outwards as a community of 200 million people. There has been no historical comparison in the world to this kind of creation of a second class citizenship. Outside that, actually the BJP is more capacious, more inclusive without changing the hierarchy of caste than the Congress ever was in 70 years. It has expanded its reach to castes and portions of society that we have not let democracy reach in 70, 75 years. We in our newsrooms have not expanded to include that capaciousness. We do not understand the portions that are being tackled and addressed by the BJP. We fail to report on them because we do not understand them. And that space has to be created. But that space is limited in small organizations. It can't be just done by small organizations. What we need at some point is a challenge where how do you create big media which takes on some of the strengths of this small segment of society of journalists that we are talking about and expands it. Uh, it's a very difficult scale up. I don't know. I'm going to try to pack in uh, two two questions. Well, uh, you had your hand up first, and then I'll get, I'll come to you. Go ahead. Good afternoon. By the way, I'm Maulik Butch, and I come from the masses land, Gujarat. So I think, uh, hello, hello. Yeah, go ahead. Ask me. Yeah, uh, my first question is: I have been trying to stay with the principles of journalism since eight years. Uh, uh, after being a, a journalist for twenty-five years and now an entrepreneur, the biggest challenge that I am being facing right now in Gujarat, having one Gujarati and one English publication, we are continuously being threatened first thing second thing it's not the authorities who threaten us it's that messy guys who threaten us now how to sustain in this environment that is something which i am looking from all of you okay. thank you yes. hello good afternoon panel i'm dr sumita dasmana from webs uh, today, uh, uh, you all are very senior professionals here in front of us and today we all have recently seen this uh, one of its own kind of awards for the content creators. So I want to understand your take on this. So, uh, what are you talking about? Content the creators. Content Creators content. Award. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah very quickly. Yes, uh, thanks for that. So um, I, I think one of the common themes that we have heard from uh, uh, different panels uh, since morning is the government is, you know, really pushing down uh, the media in multiple ways through agencies, through laws, through UAPA, through its own IT cell and other people. So what I see it as uh, it's, it's essentially a power game being played where, you know, the uh, the government is upping its power and reducing the power of the media. And if we look at, you know, press as a fourth pillar of the democracy. Now that pillar is being compressed so much that it's almost becoming like a stepping stone or a football to play with. So my question is, uh, do you feel any possibility, any feasibility or merit in the idea of you putting together, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the independent media, not the Godi media, getting together and pushing back and trying to regain that power? Because un until that power balance is restored, I think the, the problem is not going to go away and that is, in my opinion, it's the biggest issue today. So, so one minute each, guys, and then I'll make closing comments for two minutes, and then that's the end of our time. So, 
Uh, yeah, and, and we hear you. It's not that we don't hear what you've said, Mr. Butcher, what you've said uh, just now. Um, we, we definitely hear it on a daily basis. My simple uh, um, uh, response to that would be, A, that you don't have a choice. If you want to be a journalist, you don't have a choice but to do the journalism you do. You cannot suddenly decide to become something else as unfortunately some have, um, where you're essentially a vehicle for uh, government uh, propaganda. Um, the truth is that if you are going to be a journalist, there are so many other professions you can go into where you'd probably make more money and get more sleep. Um, uh, if you've decided to be a journalist, then there is no choice but to do this journalism. Uh, the second is the necessity to get up every morning with the idea that there are legal avenues that you can fight back. I remember a close friend of, uh, of mine who's a journalist said to me that he had spoken to a government official who said if the government put out 10 of these um, uh, notices, you know, instead of the four or five they put out every day, I do not have enough staff to go to the courts if they were to appeal. Why don't more people appeal? Why don't more people at least keep the rights that they can and, and push back? you know, fight back, everyday fight back. Um, and, and, and I think it's necessary uh, to, to have that conviction that eventually it, it may not be a question that's answered today. But in 30 years, when somebody asks you the question, where were you when this happened? You will have a good answer for them. Artish, you want to, any last thoughts? Under a minute? Under a minute, just that the same thing that uh, I think pessimism of the intellect, but we still have to keep doing what we need to do because it's necessary. We have to bear witness. We have to tell the stories that sometimes they will take effect. Most times they won't, but that is no reason not to do it. That's all. Smita, last thoughts? I really very much accept that keep, keep at it because there, I don't think we have an option really of, uh, you know, opting out because if you opt out, that is to you know, accept defeat. So I think we just have to push as far as we can, push in the organizations that you work in, um, try and talk to other people, collect other like-minded people, perhaps within an office, yeah. push a story together, you know, right. th you know, right. groups, you know, solidarity kind of groups. <laughs> So you've heard some Thank coping, uh, some coping strategies in the minute that I have left. I just want to emphasize the fact that, uh, you know, we've chosen, chosen this profession for a reason. And uh, that reason does not include, you know, having a peaceful time and going to bed, you know, worry free that comes with the territory. And, um, you know, which, which doesn't mean that you don't have to deal with the threats and challenges in a smart and clever way. You need to be smart, clever, strategic, know the law, know your rights, push back at every instance. Um, and, um, you know, I think rely on readers and viewers. And I would appeal to all readers and viewers that if you care about independent media, you have to come forward and support them financially. Because if you don't, then they will, uh, they will have no option but to collapse and, you know, and wither away. And, uh, you know, finally, having worked in large media organizations, I can tell you that there are so many moving parts that even the most determined government that wants to control every element of the narrative it, it does not find it easy to do that because it relies ultimately on some some edit some sub editor some deskie some reporter and i think we should shamelessly use our personal connections contacts to push back to shame you know i give you an example you mentioned the rpf uh, incident a uh, few hours after the RPF incident, I noticed a story by, uh, with the byline of a, of a young uh, colleague, a former colleague of mine who used to be with me in the Hindu and now works somewhere else. And uh, this person had done a, done a byline story which cons com consisted of planted information from what was evidently the railway minister, Mr. Ashwini Vaishnav, where he was saying, no, 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 this RPF guy was not communal. After all, he shot his boss who was Hindu. And, uh, but this is unattributed information. So I told him this friend of mine, I said, look, this guy is firing from your shoulder. Uh, out of a train of 200 people, the only person that this RPF man shoots are happen to be Muslim. He gives a communal speech. How can you uh, allow this information to be pushed through like this? And uh, the first thing I noticed was that the reporter's byline vanished. 
then when I pushed, I, di I didn't give up. I pushed further and then I got the headline changed. I got the whole thing kind of redone. And ultimately, as you know, the RPF itself has been forced to admit what this man was up to. So, you know, the fact is that, you know, reporters are allowing themselves to be used by, uh, by ministers, by bureaucrats, by officials. But to the extent to which we know these people, uh, there's no reason why we should not name and shame them. I, I, I happened to bump into uh, a Godi anchor at a, um, at a, at a lunch somewhere and I, I made it a point to tell that person and no, no, um, you know, I didn't spare any words as to what I, what I thought about the kind of work that they were doing. Uh, so I think use all these weapons and tactics. Uh, but I think the bottom line is, you know, be, um, you know, aware that the work that you do uh, comes with the comes with the risks. And I, I cannot emphasize enough what Swahasni said about the, the need to use the law. You can't allow things to go unchallenged. Uh, because if you do, uh, the more we let these things go unchallenged, the more this problem is going to multiply. Uh, so with these words, uh, I would like to thank the EGI for convening this panel on such an important topic and um, for giving us the space to say what we've just said. Thank you so much. Thank you.